Professor Malcolm McLeod from the University of Edinburgh. He is academic lead for research improvement and research integrity there at the University of Edinburgh and professor of neurology and translational neurosciences. He is one of the pioneers in the application of systematic review and meta-analyses to improve the reporting of animal research and other branches of neuroscientific research. It is our pleasure to welcome him here to the symposium. And Professor McLeod, before you start, can you share with me um, what is the longest response time to an email to Lex you have ever experienced? <laughs> like a substantive email. It's not very long. It's not very long. That sounds about right. <laughs> the floor is yours. Uh, well, well, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Lex, for giving us all an opportunity uh, to come together. You know, as we move out of, of COVID, it's just very nice to get back together and do what humans do, which is communicate together in person. And standing up on, on a lectern on a podium again, I've, I, this must be what Frank Sinatra felt like when he came out of retirement, that you would get the, the buzz, the excitement, uh, the roar of the grease paint and the smell of the crowd, as they say. Um, so, um, so what can I, so, so I'm, I'm the warm-up, I'm, I'm not Frank Sinatra, I'm Fra Frank Sinatra's warm-up act for all the other great speakers you're going to have, so I'm just going to try and warm you all up. Uh, I've, got, I've got no financial conflict of interest, but I've got a... a a, a, a kind of mongrel career that extends from in vitro research through to human clinical trials to um, some animal research, uh, all the while trying to work as a clinical neurologist and sometime as a drugs regulator. And then more recently, my institution suggesting that I might put my money where my mouth is and, if you like, move from the epidemiology uh, of bad research to its treatment. Uh, and, and I want to come on to some of those issues today. Uh, the other thing to start off with is an acknowledgement in that this work has spanned 20 odd years and has involved many uh, great, great colleagues from around about the place, around the world, particularly uh, Peter Sandico at the top here, uh, my first mentor, and then Jeff Donan, who gave me the opportunity to do all of this work at the bottom, and myriad others, and, and a fair representation, as is the case. Uh, for research improvement, a fair representation of colleagues, uh, for, for, of Dutch colleagues. So, uh, I started uh, all of this uh, trying to work out how we could translate findings from the laboratory into clinical treatments for stroke. And this is an example of translation. In, in, in Scotland, this isn't Scotland, this is Wales, this is a Welsh road sign. The work on the basis that some truck drivers in Wales can't read English, so it gives you the road sign, no entry for heavy goods vehicles, residential site only, and then it says the same thing in Welsh, except it doesn't. What it says in Welsh is, I am not in the office at the moment, send any work to be translated. So, so this, this Welsh translational road signist, if you like, hasn't understood their data processing pathway. They've got their data, they've sent it off, they've got it back, and they thought, great, I'll publish that. Um, and they did, and, and how stupid they look. Of course, we're scientists. We, there's a technique called functional magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, this is a way of finding, it's a kind of phrenology for the modern age. It identifies which parts of your brain light up when you pursue a, a certain activity. And it relies on something called the blood oxygen level dependent signal, the bold signal. signal. So when, you, when a part of your brain works, it uses more oxygen, creates more waste products of metabolism, and you can detect that. These machines are very temperamental. They need to be set up and trimmed and loved and tended uh, once a week to make sure they work properly. This group in Boston had a competition to see who could bring in the most unusual piece of organic material to trim the scanner on a Monday. And one day it was Craig's turn. He got halfway to work. He went, I forgot. Uh, and he was just at that time passing the Boston fish market. He thought, no one's put a fish in the scanner before. It might make it smell for a couple of days, but I'll win the prize for the most unusual piece of organic material. And that was free beer at the work barbecue, so a prize worth having. So they took the salmon, put it in the scanner, twiddled the knobs, got it all set up. And then their healthy human volunteer that day did not show. 
and his genius was to do the experiment on the salmon. So one mature Atlantic salmon participated in the fMRI study. It was 18 inches long, weighed 3.8 pounds. They didn't know whether it was male or female. And the task administered to the salmon involved completing an open-ended mentalizing task. It was shown a series of photographs of human subjects with a specified emotional valence. They were happy or sad or, or, or confused. And the salmon was asked to determine which emotion the human subject in the photograph was experiencing at the time. Uh, several active voxels were discovered in the salmon brain cavity with a cluster level of significance of less than one in a thousand. Uh, and so as they conclude, either we've stumbled onto a rather amazing discovery in terms of post-mortem ichthyological cognition, that's to say dead salmon can think, or there's something wrong with this approach. And of course there's something uh, wrong with this approach, and it's the flexibility in data analysis that these techniques give, that there are hundreds of thousands of ways in which these data can be processed, and if you twiddle the dials enough, something is bound to come up. Uh, and they've got the Ig Nobel Prize for Neuroscience 10 years ago, and rightly so. Now, those are radiologists, and I don't know if there's any radiologists in the room, but in my medical school, they always came in the bottom half of the class and shouldn't really trust what they published very much, except, except for our ones at Edinburgh, who are obviously brilliant. Uh, but what about, what about proper scientists, bench scientists, animal scientists? Well, this is bench science from NIH, Walter Reed. This is testing drugs in an animal model of focal cerebral ischemia. So you've got two middle cerebral arteries, you block one of them, some of the animals you give the drugs, some of them don't, you come back three days later and measure the volume of brain which has been killed off. And here they're testing low-dose glutamate and homeopathic arnica montana in this rat model of middle cerebral artery. And you can see that half-dose, low-dose glutamate is pretty good, and full-dose, low-dose glutamate achieves an improvement in infarct volume of, of 40%, which is industry standard for a neuroprotective drug. But when I tell you that half-dose, low-dose glutamate is 10 to the minus 120 molar and full-dose is 10 to the minus 60 molar, then those of you who remember Avogadro's constant will appreciate that there isn't any low-dose glutamate in either of these dynamite plots. There's water. And so either homeopathy works, but of course if homeopathy worked, 10 to the minus 120 molar should be the more powerful treatment. So these results aren't consistent with the tenets of either uh, Western belief systems or homeopathy. So there's something going wrong. And many years ago with Jeff Donan, who I showed you earlier on, Antonio Collins, we looked at it for evidence from the laboratory of compounds that might work in laboratory models of stroke, in vivo or, or in vitro. And we found over a thousand compounds which had been tested in experimental stroke, of which over 600 had been tested in that focal cerebral ischemia, middle cerebral artery occlusion model that I told you about. Remarkably, almost 400 of those improved outcome in those models, of which 97 had gone on to be tested in human clinical trial. So that's great, isn't it? Except only one of those drugs tested in human clinical trial actually improved outcome, clot-busting treatment with TPA. And actually that was tested in clinical trial not because it worked in animal models, although it does, and Emily Sen has shown that in a systematic review meta-analysis, but because it worked in a cognate human condition, myocardial infarction, caused by occlusion of a blood vessel to another critical organ. And we've got three treatments, stroke unit care, decompressive hemicraniectomy, uh, and aspirin, which improve outcome, which have never been near, or were not developed through animal, that pathway for, for, for stroke treatment. So attrition rates either 99.7% or 100%, but either way, it's not good. Uh, so what might be going wrong? There was a drug called NXY059 developed by AstraZeneca as a potential treatment for stroke, and everyone thought it was going to work. Promising early phase human data, a clinical trial that they said, oh, we got the wrong endpoint, but we think it works if you look at it this way. They were so convinced it was going to work, they were sending drug reps around to see whether I preferred the pink or the purple packaging for what they were going to call Cerevive, because it made your cerebrum survive, until their phase three trial came out showing that it was inert. Their, uh, in the following 48 hours, their market capitalization dropped by more than the gross domestic product of the Bahamas. Uh, and it took them seven years to recover from that, from that fall. And when we, with the benefit of hindsight, went back and used this technique of meta-analysis to look at those animal data, overall you can see it improves outcome, the grey bars are the 95% confidence limits, overall it improves outcome by 44%, so it's great. But when you look at those studies that reported measures to reduce the risk of bias in the experiments, where they randomised the allocation to, to treatment group, where they blinded the conduct of the experiment, where they blinded the evaluation of outcome, those experiments gave substantially and significantly lower estimates of effect size. 
Note one of these 11 publications did all three of these things, and the two used by the company to get doctors like me to put patients into the trial did none of these things. So with the benefit of hindsight, it's easy to see why that didn't work. So a bit about blinding and why it's important, because you can usually find what you're looking for. This is Robert Rosenthal, fi file drawer problem Rosenthal, but he also did this very interesting experiment where he took 12 graduate psychology students doing a project with him for a semester. And at the end, they did a five-day experiment testing rats cognition in a tea maze where they had... So the, the animal's put in the stem of the tea maze and one arm is lit and the other isn't, and which is which is flipped according to a predetermined random schedule, and the unlit arm is always reinforced with a food reward. So rather like our junior faculty early career researchers, the rat is trained to turn to the dark side. Um, and they, they compared two groups of, of, of rats, one which had been selected for many generations at Berkeley, uh, which at that time was a great centre for, for animal cognition research, for, for good performance. Performance, excellent performance in cognitive tasks, although they were naive to this particular task. And the other was their slightly dumb and duller, equally inbred country cousins. Um, and so they ran these in, in the maze for five days, and what you can see is that the, the maze bright animals started off better than the maze dull animals, and both cohorts of animals improved over the week, but that improvement was much more substantial in the maze, in the maze bright animals, as you would expect. And when he asked the students what they thought of their animals, the maze bright animals were, were lovely animals, were rats with lovely wet noses and, and, and sprightly tails, the sort of rat that you'd like to take home to meet your mum and dad. Um, and the maze dull animals were surly and insolent, and in fact, three students were bitten by their maze dull animals. And in fact, the experiment which Rosenthal had done wasn't on the rats, because the rats were selected from the same cages in the same animal house on the Monday morning. The only difference between them in their automatically ascertained maze performance and in their biting behaviour was in the expectations of the investigators and how that transferred to their handling of the animals and to the animals' behaviour. But you know, this is a long time ago, and we know that, that, uh, that neuroscience research in, in particular has come a long way. So uh, 10 years ago just now, uh, I was involved in a group that put together uh, what I call the Landis criteria. Story Landis uh, led us in developing four things that you really wanted to know about an animal study to be able to do due diligence on the research claim. Was it randomized? Was it blinded? Did it, ha did it have a power calculation? And were all the animals that went into the experiment accounted for in your description of what happened? And in the UK, we've got this lovely thing. It used to be called the Research Assessment Exercise. And this is the Research Assessment Exercise for 2008. It's, uh, it's since had its name changed to the Research Excellence Framework, a supreme bit of nominative determinism. So you can be sure to know how they reported this year. Everything was brilliant. Even in 2008, they thought everything was brilliant in the neurosciences. They thought we were outstanding, particularly in the neurosciences. Uh, and this didn't really match with what we were seeing. Uh, so we went to the five institutions that performed best in REF 2008 for animal research. Uh, and I'm delighted to say the University is, uh, uh, of Edinburgh is one of these. I've not named them uh, to protect my future career uh, more than anything else, but there's a lovely Scottish blue colour in the middle of there. We found over a 1,000 publications and worked out how well they, they met the Landis criteria. And you can see randomization from about 15%, blinding from about 20 inclusion exclusion criteria 10%, power calculations in 2%. This is shockingly poor. Shockingly, shockingly, outrageously poor. Only one paper out of 1,173 did all four of these things, and 68% of them did not one. So if you want to know why there's difficulty translating from the laboratory to clinical practice, that might be a good place to start. So, so here we have a problem with, with, with the generalizability, the usefulness of research findings. And there are a whole host of reasons why a research finding might not reproduce, might not replicate. You might have made a, a type 1 error. If p is less than 0 0.05, sometimes it's less than 0 0.05 because it, it, it is. Uh, or you might make a claim that happens to be true under your own particular circumstances of testing but does not generalize well. Or, and I think most critically, the observations may have been due to suboptimal study designs, 
which allow the emergence of bias. But the things that we all get terribly exercised about is, that, is deliberate research or malfeasance, making things up, falsification, fabrication, plagiarism. And my, the one thing I want you to take home from today is that this is the most important thing. And this is the integrity of a research claim. And this is what we spend all of our time worrying about. And in my institution, the same office has been responsible for both of these things, which means when people come and speak to me from this office, I think they're accusing me of fraud. So this is research integrity, and this is researcher integrity, and I think these are critical distinctions. Because researchers are different. We exist on a spectrum from falsification and fabrication and plagiarism to hypothesizing after results are known to doing experiments at risk of bias, which lots of people do and would rather they didn't, to better things like open science practices and pre-registration, and you'll hear about some of these later on today. So our problem is that we've tried to identify these most egregious cheats at the lower end of the spectrum, march them from the building, pausing only to pack their belongings in a cardboard box and remove their library card, telling them never to darken our door again. And these are a tiny, tiny, tiny part of the problem that we face. So given this distribution, we can either do this, which is wrong, or in the same way as we try and measure blood pressure in the, small, in, in, in the population or, or change salt intake, we can try and shift behaviours. And the, the, the weighted area under the curve is much better if everyone's behaviour improves just by 1 or 2%, rather than getting rid of even the 15% of most egregious behaviours. So instead of research accountability, which is individually focused with a perfection myth focusing on solo practitioners and seeing shortcomings as something that we need to publish, I'll put these up on OSF once I sit down so, so you can, uh, and then I'll tweet about it. Research improvement sh should be systems focused, recognizing fallibility, emphasizing teamwork, valuing local opinion and local peer view. And when we see something that isn't working, we should celebrate it because we know how to do it better tomorrow. And if we never recognize that we've done it wrong today, we'll never do it better tomorrow. And that's a huge problem at the heart of it. So, Conscious of time. We've got this challenge in our institutions. We've got lots and lots of bright people doing experiments to test causality. And yet, faced with research improvement, we go, how would we ever get from thinking that an intervention might lead to an improvement? What skills would we... This, we have these skills. These are skills that we deploy every day in our research. And I've tried to articulate this idea of a research improvement cube where we put these potential interventions in a three-dimensional space defined by the costs of the intervention, the benefits of the intervention, and the certainty that we have in those costs and benefits. So we are, if we have something where we're pretty sure it's expensive and that it doesn't work, of course we're not going to do that at all. On the other hand, if we've got something which we're pretty confident works and is low cost, one might implement that with audit rather than seeking better evidence. But if you've got an intervention which is high cost, high benefit, but we're uncertain, to get my institution to invest in that, I'm going to need better evidence that it works. And so I'm going to need randomized evidence that the intervention leads to a difference. So here's an example. This is the Landis paper. And Nature changed their guidance for, uh, for, for, for authors at, at the time. And we looked at what difference that made in Nature, so the Nature Journal. So this is interrupted time series analysis. Every uh, Nature article matched with something in another uh, journal, uh, non-Springer journal. And you can see in blue is the change in performance at Nature. In red is the change in performance at other institutions. It made a huge difference at Nature. It was a lot of hard work, but that one out of a thousand papers that did the right thing in my UK data set, 16% of Nature papers met that threshold after this change. So important change. Uh, there is a set of guidelines for animal research called the ARRIVE guidelines, and with Caitlin here and Emily Senna, we did a little study because the people who initiated the ARRIVE guidelines were getting very vexed that they, uh, they were getting people to, the journals were endorsing the guidelines and performance wasn't changing. So they said they just need to, journals just need to enforce the guidelines. Uh, and we said that's an interesting hypothesis, so we did a randomized control trial of whether or not enforcing the guidelines made a difference. And essentially we randomized over 1,600 papers, over 600 made it through to publication, and the requirement that the 
journal received a completed checklist made zero difference to compliance with the ARRIVE guidelines. It was 0% in both groups. So just asking authors to do something doesn't change anything. Who knew? So how might we go about, just very quickly now to finish, I'm conscious of time, how might an institution go about changing things? Well, we're interested in how long it takes our, our research findings to get into the public domain. If research findings have value, and we hope that they do, then economists would tell us that that value depreciates over time. Economists would say 6% a year depreciation rate. So how can we shorten the time to publication? Well, this is what happens to animal research in Edinburgh from when the research is initiated, day zero is when I ask the animal house for my animals. And this is a Kaplan-Meier survival curve for how long it takes that the resulting research to be published. And you can see that over 200 days of that research life cycle is spent on the journal desk. So what we are doing now is re-auditing this with an encouragement for all of our researchers to put everything up on bioarchive or other preprint servers as soon as it's ready for publication so it can be reused. And openness, this is a hat tip to Nick Riedel, who was at the charity with Uli Dernago. We're now using in our a stroke research group, uh, this audit of the openness of our publication. So we take our ORCID IDs and we throw them on paywall and we get, uh, we get a monthly report on the openness of our publications to try and fuel these improvements. So thinking about this distribution, then open research practices, I think, can move us in one direction and poor research cultures move us in the opposite direction. And thinking, and I tweeted about this the other day, Lex, and you'll have seen the tweet, uh, that there are these three different, that there's this kind of mess of research culture and research integrity and open science and how it's all come together. What's the gestalt of what good, well, the gestalt of what good research is, is somewhere in the middle. This is God and, and the Holy Trinity. So none of these are the same thing, but they all contribute to what we mean by a, a good research culture. So thank you very much for listening. I would just say, Lex, in ending, that I hope that you're going to do a Frank Sinatra and you're going to come back a few times to entertain us again. But thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks so much, Dr. McLeod. There is time for a couple of questions. So Yuri will be bringing the microphone to you if you have a question. In the meantime, I just realized that I did not introduce myself. Now, I take it you've all seen my name on the program, but I'm still going to say my name. I'm Jeroen de Ridder, and I'm Associate Professor of Philosophy, uh, and I've been collaborating with Lex for a couple of years now. Um, so that's who I am. Yes, go ahead. Yes, hello. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Uh, my name is Miriam Erlings. I'm from uh, the University of Maastricht. And uh, I was actually wondering um, how this message comes across to your, uh, to your colleagues. Uh, because, of course, I, I think the people here in the room are very positive about research integrity. But do you ever um, yeah, get criticism? Uh, so I, so it, it hugely, like all human endeavor, it hugely depends on the people doing it uh, in, in that you know, if you go in and say, you guys are all rubbish, I know what, I know what, you know, I've spent 20 years trying to do this research, some idiot comes in from my research office and says, yeah, you, this is just crap, so this is, this is just lousy, this is a, then of course I'm going to front up and, and say you don't understand the complexity of what I'm doing. But if you try and walk in their shoes, if you try and say this isn't, be, be, this isn't about us thinking that what you do isn't good. It's about saying everyone could be a little bit better. And how can we help you get a little bit better? And actually the people who best know how you can get a little bit better in your research is you, but you don't necessarily have the improvement skills to be able to do these plan, do, study, act cycles for how for. So let us bring that expertise and you bring your content expertise and let's work together to try and to, to, to try and improve things. And I think that I think that's really, really critical that it's a conversation and a collaboration rather than an externally imposed uh, set of demands. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman in the back. Hello, my name is Marie Segers, also Maastricht uh, University. Uh, you advertise uh, uh, open publishing, published first as a bioarchive or meta archive, uh, because that uh, speeds up the, uh, the knowledge development. What's your experience in journals? Do they accept that or m more and more, or is it still difficult? Yeah, j journals, journals are generally very supportive of that, and the few that aren't are gradually getting left by the wayside because it's such an attractive model. The, 
the, the, the main pushback is that people say, oh, but it's not peer-reviewed, so I can't believe it. To which I would say, have you read the published literature? <laughs> because one in 1,000 of those does the four things that we can, tells you about the four things. It's not that they didn't randomize, it's that they don't tell you whether or not, so as a research user, I can't do due diligence on the published work, I can't do due diligence on, on, on stuff in archives. And the idea that, that, that having been through peer review, I can lift up a paper and believe it, it's not true. And that's the only advantage, sorry, that's the only advantage that the peer review literature has if it makes something credible that wasn't credible before. And I think uh, certainly for animal research, that jury's out. Hi, this is Bahar Mehmani um, from Elsevier. I have a question, uh, now that you mentioned how it should be among the researchers and how journals could play a role, I'm wondering how funders and institutions can play a role upstream where the research proposals are being accepted based on the follow-up studies and so on. Uh, so, so I, th I well, we could hear more about funders later on. I think funders have got a much more important role because I think the current career structure for researchers is just lousy. I mean, the idea that you go... So if you take a three-year postdoc, you've got six months bedding in, then you've got to get some data. You're going to be applying for your next put about eight months before you finish, which means it needs to be submitted. You know, there isn't time to produce anything in three years, so we need to have run through training for... And I would much rather that funders focused on that than this other stuff. Um, but, I, but I think carrots and sticks for funders, you know, what... Uh, I, I had a, I, I, a semi-express conflict of interest earlier on uh, about being uh, leader of the guarantors of Equip. So Equip was an IMI project that we worked with in industry to try and develop ways in which labs could evaluate their practices around study quality, around open science, around data handling and management and control. Uh, and we've created a self-assessment tool which funders can ask their applicants to complete and to upload that as a PDF. With, and, and funders are understandably reluctant to completely endorse something out, out the box. My own view, and, and it, it, it's also my view of, of, of journals as it happens, is that the professional staff in funding agencies and in journals for, for whom this is their daily bread and butter are actually really pretty hot on all of this stuff already because it's, the, it's, the, it's their day-to-day -day work. And then it lands on a peer review panel Someone says, yeah, but you know, if this science was, if this idea is true, it would be so transformative. I don't care if they've not said about random, because we all know Johnny, and he does great work, and I'm sure he will random, and they end up with this rubbish getting, j j so. <laughs> <laughs> One final question. <laughs> Malcolm Bobsy oh, Link, uh, Land University Medical Center. So, uh, Camaradas is the research group, but you're also the academic lead for research quality, I believe. Uh, research improvement and research integrity. Well, there we go. Um, my question is, um, is that a paper title or does it come with perks, with buy-in, with money? Um, what does the University of Edinburgh actually gave you with the title? Uh, <laughs> to, to be, to be well, they, uh, they don't give me any money, if you, if you want me to buy you a drink later on. Uh, I'm as poor as I ever was. Um, they, they give me access, and actually so far they've given me a free reign to, to you know, access with fairly high levels uh, within decision making in the organisation. So for instance, when the Welcome brought out their research culture survey late 2019, I said to then my folks, we should do this, and they said, oh, well, that seems like a good idea, so we did, and we got the results, and I said, well, we should get a research culture action plan, and they said, that's an idea, and they got someone to develop that, and we're about to go into the field with, a, uh, with uh, the second iteration of our research culture survey to see if there's been any change in a couple of years. I said that I wanted to set up these research improvement projects, they said, that's fine, we're having a good research practice week in November, where we're going to have four co-creation sessions inviting researchers to create research improvement projects with funding available for them and with 
uh, methodological help for those kind of uh, IHI type PDSA cycle improvement activity and then to come back six months down the line and work out what worked well and what didn't. And, and, and you know, all I want is, is it, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd love to have a car and a driver and an official residence, obviously. <laughs> uh, but, but actually just being allowed to get on with things is the, is the biggest gift an institution can give you. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. So in philosophy, um, Scottish philosophers are known for defending common sense. So I'm glad to see that <laughs> the neuroscientists too are keeping up that tradition. So thank you so much, Dr. McLeod. Well, thank you. <clears throat>